I assume uh I assume uh all these fruit growers probably have a garden in their backyard too. So hopefully this uh uh um this will work out for y'all as well. But yeah, like was said, uh yeah, I, you know, I appreciate everybody attending tonight and I'm Michael Washburn. Um I currently serve as the preservation director at Seed Savers Exchange. Now I've spent most of my life in the South in Texas and Kentucky uh, and most recently in Tennessee where I worked along uh, side old uh, seed saver John Koikendall for about a decade. That's where I learned a lot of uh, a lot of the things I know about seed saving and preservation. Um, and we did a lot of preservation work um, down in Tennessee uh, for Seed Savers Exchange, working on some southern varieties down there. And then I moved to Iowa about a year and a half ago. So this winter thing's been an adjustment, uh, but it hasn't been too bad. Uh, we are in a zone 4B. Uh, unlike uh, y'all in the, the 8 to 10 range there. So quite a bit of difference going on. Uh, so yeah, I currently live in Decorah, Iowa, uh, and that's where Seed Service Exchange is located. Um, but yeah, I'm happy to be in your company, so thanks for having me. So I titled this um, backyard or Creating a Family Legacy, Backyard Garden Seed Saving. And so the objectives of this talk are to kind of reacquaint ourselves with what an heirloom seed really is. Um, and I'm gonna provide three extraordinary examples of heirloom seeds and their stories. Uh, I'm gonna cover some basic seed saving techniques of our most popular crop types. Um, and I'll explain how seeds are truly preserved, which is in your backyard. And then I will provide some, uh, some ways folks could get involved. So what is an heirloom seed? So co-founder Kent Wheelie can contribute his first hearing of the word heirloom to the infamous bean collector, John Withy. Now, John and Kent were talking at a conference and John referred to some old beans as heirlooms. And that seemed to strike Kent. And so he asked John if he could use that term. And he said, well, heck yeah, because I stole it from another fella. <laughs> And so what aspects of a seed make it an heirloom? How can I put this little sentence together and say that heirloom seeds are a historical record of continuous human selection of desired traits in order to nourish and feed one another. And so heirloom seeds encompass the farming culture and the techniques that people used. They also encompass the harvest, harvesting traditions, you know, like when and how to harvest a crop. They also hold the dishes that the family made and what common dishes were cooked with a certain variety. Also special events, holidays, or ceremonies that were centered around a certain crop. And then of course the family stories that went along with it. So I'm gonna tell you about three wonderful examples of heirloom seeds and their stories that go along with those seeds. So my first one's about that infamous bean collector I spoke of before, John Withy. Now, he and his family had an heirloom practice that was handed down over generations where they would cook beans in what is called, they called the bean hole. Um, this is how the family cooked their beans for Saturday night supper. So there was a big hole dug in the front yard. is about the depth of a couple Dutch ovens. And then the hole was lined with bricks, leaving enough space to lower the Dutch oven down in. And the pot of beans was lowered in the hole and the pot was covered with hot coals and dirt. And that was done on Friday afternoon and left in a hole until Saturday supper. Now I gave this speech um, some time ago and somebody asked, is that similar to a clam dig? So someone told me that they would, and I, I thought of y'all uh, just now, uh, that folks would cook clams in the sand down in a hole kind of along the same way. Uh, maybe the old uh, low and slow technique for clams, but something I'd heard of recently. Hmm. And so as a young fellow, you know, John was a market gardener and he did this to help his family out financially. And so this was the first time he'd grown beans on a large scale. And John preferred to grow the pretty beans. And he said that that's what he attributed, attributed his success to is just how beautiful they were. Now, John was also quite the adventurer. He had a bunch of explorer buddies that introduced him to all types of places. Took a couple of trips to the Arctic, 
really enjoyed the Rocky Mountains. But every year, John made it back to Maine to put in a garden. So later on, John found a good job as a medical photographer, and he moved to the Boston suburbs. But he said that move caused him some bean trauma because he kept moving from apartment to apartment complex, and he was not able to put out a garden. Yet finally, John and his family left Boston and purchased land in Linfield, Massachusetts. And this is when he set out to reestablish the family tradition and method of cooking beans in that bean hole. So now while John could easily remember, you know, how to recreate that tradition, but he couldn't find the type of bean that his family traditionally used. Now this bean that's on the screen right now, that, that, that's the Jacob's cattle bean, and that was his bean. Um, kind of a common one to uh, bean collectors these days. And he realized, though, that the only way he was going to be able to recreate that bean of his heritage was to grow them himself. So John set out a hunt to find his family bean. And I would just like to take a moment to uh, pay respects to, um, you know, beans didn't just pop out into John's family in the 1800s, uh, or corn and squash. And a lot of these varieties I talk about are indigenous varieties. And unfortunately, many of these stories end up on our doorstep uh, from non-native um, um, stories or stewardship. But um, all these varieties have a longer history than the ones, unfortunately, we get to talk about. And, and it's such a delight when we do get some indigenous history that that's, uh, accompanies some of these, these varieties. Um, but yeah, I just want to make, I just like to talk about that. And I think it's important to talk about the, the origin of, of where these came from. And there's just a long line of stewardship um, that comes along with these. If only I had the whole story of the Jacob's cattle bean, that would be something fantastic. But you know, this journey to find the family bean, it led him to meet many others that had their own heirloom beans and stories that went along with them. Yet too often those stories ended in, well, we lost the family bean. And so this prompted John Withy to start collecting, sharing and preserving the beans and the histories that went along with them. So this is a picture of John and uh, and his bean collection, and and actually we have this um, this piece uh, at Seed Savers today. Huh. And so John spent nearly two decades stewarding one of the largest bean collections in the country, and in the process he organized like-minded seed savers and united a community of passionate gardeners under the name When Again Associates picture of John there. And so as John got up in his age, he decided to donate his entire collection to Seed Savers Exchange in 1983. And for the last 40 years, with the help of the yearbook exchange community, Seed Savers Exchange has been growing out John's collection and sharing them with others. Now, if you go into our database, uh, which holds the 20 plus thousand varieties of seeds we have, and keeps everything in order. When something enters the database, it, it gets a number. So the first corn ever donated is corn number one. John's bean collection encompasses bean one through 1185. So John donated mm -hmm. 1185 different varieties of beans to the collection. Oh. So the second story I'd like to talk about is Regina Centauri and her Rizzi softball plum tomato. A little larger than the plum tomatoes we're used to seeing. And so if you were to take the Seed Savers Exchange 2000, the, the 22 uh, yearbook, you'd read that Regina writes, I need your help to keep these seeds going. So Regina Centauri is from Knoxville, Tennessee. That's where I'm from. And she stewarded this heirloom tomato that's been in her family for over 100 years. Now, the seeds came to the U.S. with her great-grandfather to upstate New York from Barletta, Italy, around the turn of the century in 1900. So as soon as Regina's grandfather, Vito, and his father, Regina's great-grandfather, had space of their own, Vito wrote to his older sister, 
Immacolata in Italy. Of course, in Italian, but that translates to, he wrote, send me the tomato seeds. So in order to not get busted by the mail system for sending seeds, uh, Emma Collada hid the seeds in the glue uh, in the enclosure of the envelope. And ever since that, Vito's entire backyard was covered in tomato plants every year thereafter. So not only did Vito raise these every year, he carefully selected the best seedlings to put in his yard year after year. And he watered, he babied those plants with his water manu uh, manure mixture by hand. So the old compost uh, manure tea. And so when Vito passed, Regina's uncle Lou, Lou Rizzi, he's the one on the left there, he took over the stewardship. And of Lou's four brothers and four sisters, only Lou continued the stewardship of the tomato seed which was eventually handed down to Regina in 2010. And so Lou had said he had found the vial of seeds in the 40s and that they germinated no problem. Well, he'd found them from the 40s and that they had germinated no problem. Um, but Lou can no re longer raise them due to health reasons. And that's when Regina took over. And that was in 2010. And unfortunately, Lou passed in 2019. That's a picture of Regina. And she wrote in the yearbook as well. She says she's in love with vegetable gardening and sustenance techniques in general. She said, I've made my own cheese. And she's also a classically trained soprano and an avid ocean fisherman. Now, and I'll talk a little bit more about this yearbook. This yearbook that is, um, is a collection of seed savers, hundreds of seed savers that list the seeds that they wanna make available to the public along with all the seeds that we have uh, in the seed bank that we make available to the public. Um, and so when people uh, put their seeds in there, they write a little bit about themselves so folks get to know them a little bit. Uh, and so you'll know kind of who you're sharing seeds with. Kind of neat to read. There's the tomato again. So they're really huge compared to other plum tomatoes and they average about 10 ounces a piece. Oh. And they can be a good slicer, but she says that they really shine in a tomato sauce. And she said there was always this distinct smell coming from her grandmother's basement kitchen that's etched in her brain. And it's the smell of those tomatoes being turned into pasta sauce. And she says when she was young, grandma was down in the basement and wouldn't let the kids come down. And they're like, ah, she's down there eating all the tomatoes to herself. But I guess her and her cousin finally figured out she was just down there canning. Didn't want to be pestered. And so she says, I save my tomatoes from only the best tasting fruit. And when saving them, she waits until the white mold grows on top of the dish. Uh, and, and they start to stink. So you know you're on the right track there. And she says, I dry them off in a towel. And that's how her uncle taught her. And that it works perfectly. Yet Regina experienced some difficulties in Tennessee that her brother didn't experience in New York with the heat down there. And so she counteracted this by planting the tomatoes deep in the ground, added oh, irrigation, very faintly. And, uh, and had plenty of uh, no, ground cover on there. Very faintly. And no, this I can is something very faintly, but I can't make it out. Oh, sorry, I'm, I'm hearing something. <laughs> I didn't know somebody was trying to talk to me there. Um, but this is just a good example of, of what it takes to kind of start to adapt something to a different location. And so she writes, I've done my best to raise at least a few each year, but I need your help. And so she'll give you the seeds for free as long as you promise to list them in the exchange because she wants other folks listing and sharing as well. And so since then, I've asked my old buddy down in Knoxville to help her out and 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 uh, and help steward some of those seeds. And I've got a buddy down there that's a goat farmer that's going to help her out too. So we've got we've got reinforcements on the way. And so the last story I'll talk about is the Fortna white pumpkin. Again, another indigenous crop. Um, and so we thank the stewards for. You know, all the work that it 
it's taken to to get these crops into our hands these days. But um, this is the Fortna White Pumpkin. And so Sue Ellen Fortna Major, she's the daughter of Wayne uh, Fortna. And Sue's dad, Wayne, he grew up growing this pumpkin his whole life, and he saved the seed year after year. And so he got the seed from his family that came from around the Franklin County uh, area in Pennsylvania. And it was always just known as the white pumpkin until it got spread around in Sue's mom's family where they decided to give it the name the Fortna White Pumpkin. And that's how a lot of things get named. Many times it's by charismatic features on a, especially with beans or corn or things like that, or it becomes a family name. Um, but of course, you know, the Fortnas weren't the original stewards of that, but came along and, and didn't have a name. So they went ahead and, and named it that. And, you know, when we try to reconnect seeds to indigenous um, communities, it becomes very difficult because unless there's an elder in the community uh, that can identify the seeds, um, we get different names that come with them. So lots of times it's hard to reconnect those seeds, but, but, uh, but that's one of our our efforts is that reconnection there. And so Wayne's parents were farmers and teachers, and Wayne was also a teacher, and he was called to serve duty in World War II. And after his return, he realized what we now know as PTSD, and he wasn't able to go back to teaching. So Wayne took up gardening, which got him back into the soil and back into nature, as Sue recalls. She said gardening saved him. And Sue says it's a great pie pumpkin and that they're easy to grow. And her father Wayne was particular in where they went in the garden. So we'd have them on one end of the garden and we'd go grow cucumbers on the other, other end of the garden. And he'd grow the pumpkin along where he planted the corn so the vines could grow under the corn. And he would plant a row in the edge of the garden and continue to train the the pumpkin vines into the corn. So that's two pieces of the old indigenous uh, um, practice of three sisters farming. So we're just missing the, the beans there to provide the nitrogen. But um, that's one of the reasons I, I studied uh, traditional farming practices. It's just many of those old techniques just have stood the test of time. And I think Three Sisters is probably one of the most popular and commonly used indigenous practices that's uh, still carried on today. And so Sue's father, Wayne, he passed in 1990. And Sue continued to grow them pumpkin year after year because it was a tradition that they that was the pumpkin that they used for their Thanksgiving pumpkin pie. And so his passing prompted her to share the seeds with the Landis Valley Farm Museum in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. And so her hopes were, was that they would continue to grow out the pumpkin and be an additional steward. And that's many times what we serve as, as either an additional steward, or if somebody doesn't have anybody take on that stewardship, we do the same. And so her action to share the seeds with the farm museum, you know, it really played a key role in the continuation of the family heirloom because 25 years after Sue inherited the seeds, she actually lost them. And so she wrote to the Landis Valley Farm Museum and admitted that she wasn't quite the farmer that her father was and that she had accidentally let her seeds mold. Luckily, the Landis Valley Farm Museum had been growing the pumpkin and was able to reunite uh, Sue uh, with the Fortna White pumpkin seed. And you can actually go to their website today and buy the seeds uh, from the Landis Valley Farm Museum. And so those are some great examples of all the various forms of culture that an heirloom seed can encompass. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about um, uh, some seed, some aspects of saving your own seed on some of our most popular crop types. So I'll start with one of the easiest ones, it's beans. Uh, again, native to South and North America. So it's a really good one to start on uh, because the isolation distance is really short. Um, it's a perfect flower, um, so it, it fertilizes itself. And so you only need 10 to 20 feet uh, distance from other beans in order to maintain uh, the purity of that variety. 
And I do want to encourage, I'm going to talk about isolation distances and keeping things true to type for heirloom varieties, but I also find it fun to let things cross up sometimes and have fun and see what you get. Um, just don't sow all your seeds if you're going to be playful and set some back. Um, and so again, the um, it's easy because your maturity, the seeds are mature and ready to save for seed uh, when the seed pods turn tan and dry. And we've all shelled, you know, most of us probably shelled beans. And then that's what we're looking for when the seeds, uh, when the pods are nice and dry and uh, you kind of hear them rattling, then you know you're good. Um, you can maintain a variety by simply saving one off of one plant, but I encourage everybody to have at least five to 10 plants for good uh, genetic diversity. And then we're gonna grow 20 plants at the farm just to really make sure we've got all the genetics in that. Uh, so very easy. I mean, we've all seen this on the left there. It's got your, your green beans and they're developing in there, but the other side, the one in the lower, uh, the lower left there, that pod's nice and dry, and that's a good good stage to harvest that, and your seeds mature, and I'd feel good about harvesting that. Um, so you can just shell them out by hand. That's the old time practice. Folks would sit around on the front porch with friends, good time to chat and carry on the lost art of conversation and uh, shell some beans together. Or I guess there's probably not too many wood burning stoves down there, but uh, <laughs> in places that have them, it's a nice thing to do in the winter. And so for all, for most of these, like for beans, once you shell those out, put them in a bowl in the kitchen, a place you're gonna walk by a couple times a day that are not in direct sunlight and just run your hands through them a couple of times a day and do that for about a month. And by then they'll be nice and dry and you can go ahead and put them in a Ziploc and throw them in the freezer and they'll store indefinitely in that condition. All right, tomato, I think we all grow tomatoes. Again, South American, Central American variety. Isolation, again, this is a perfect flower, male and female parts in the flower and generally pollinated by the time the flower opens. So 10 to 50 feet uh, is good um, isolation to keep those varieties true to type. Um, now you will have the occasion if you have a tomato when the flower is closed, but that little stigma sticks out beyond that that's where you have your chance of, of cross-pollinating different tomato types, just because that, that stigma protrudes from there. So if you have a type and you notice that, then you know that it's probably gonna need a little bit of more isolation than most of your, uh, of your varieties. Uh, and again, you know, seeds ready to be harvested and is mature at market maturity. So when you're ready to eat the tomato, it's the seeds are ready to harvest. My old buddy lets them hang on just a little bit longer uh, but um, which I think is a fair practice. He gets good germination, but, but generally if they're ready to eat, the seed is mature. Again, you can have viability off of one plant, but five to 10 will give you some good genetics uh, to carry on with that. A little bit different on the, on the, what you have to do to get your uh, tomato seed though. Um, so first you just wanna squeeze out the tomato, get as much as many of those seeds and juice and get that into a jar. Um, and then next you're gonna to wanna to ferment them. So this fermentation is gonna break down the gelatinous sac and that gelatinous sac keeps the tomato seed from germinating. And so we wanna break that down. And so here you can see these cork containers here. And if you look at the one in the bottom right, it's starting to get a little bit of white mold on top. And, and that's what we're looking for. And as my old buddy says, when they start to look bad and smell even worse, well, you know you're on the right track. So a good two to three days, maybe four ferment, fermenting those, you'll get some white mold over top, uh, but, but you're on the right track then. <clears throat> so after that, you just wanna take them, throw them in a colander, spray them out with water and get as much of that gelatinous material out of there, uh, as clean as you can get it from there. And then you wanna spread it out on a, um, a baking sheet or a sheet pan, you know, I would, I'd say don't put them on a cloth or paper towel. They'll have a tendency to stick to them. Um, so something like a sheet pan or a baker's mat work really well. And then just as those dry, you just kind of start to break them up and kind of scatter them out the best you can. And once you get them broken up pretty good, you can throw them in a bowl right next to your beans, uh, run your hand through them a couple of times a day. And then after a month, 
uh, Ziploc and into the freezer, and they will store indefinitely there. Putting them on parchment paper works well too. For yeah, the, I, um, drying. Yeah, I guess that would make sense. Yeah, they won't stick to that, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. And so on to squash again, South America, Central America. That's where these these come from. Um, but here we've got a larger isolation distance, so 800 feet to a half a mile to maintain purity of a, on a variety. Um, and that's because they're insect pollinated. So we have a different, I'm sure as many of you know, we've got a male flower and a female flower. And so insects doing the pollinating. So we got to keep these separated. Um, but it's all right because we have several types within the squash, uh, within our squashes that we could grow side by side without uh, very little chance of cross pollinating. Um, so winter types, uh, once they're ready to harvest, um, if you let those sit around for 20, 30 days inside, then your seed's nice and mature and you could go ahead and, and, uh, get viable seed from that. But our summer types, uh, we're going to have to, uh, go further than market maturity on those. So we're looking for those zucchinis that hid under the leaves and turned into baseball bats and got way too big. Those are the ones, uh, that, that we're going to try to save seed off of. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, again, five to 10 plants in the backyard garden is, is good for genetic preservation on that. So you could grow the Argyosperma, uh, which is your Kushaws. That's the Fortna white pumpkin, other silver seeded gourds. Um, and so that's one type of squash you could put out there. And then you could grow right alongside of a Maxima, um, which is your banana squashes, your curries, your blue hubbards. Um, and so you could grow those side by side with little chance of crossing uh, and maintain uh, purity there. So now we've got two water squash or pumpkins we could put out in the garden and not worry about cross uh, pollination. And then you could add the machata class to that. And it's easy to tell them the machatas because they're going to be your tan skin. So your butternut squash, one of my favorites, the Muscadet Provence pumpkin, um, or my old buddy's, his favorite's the Kentucky Field pumpkin, which is a tan type, also in the Machata class. So you could grow all three of those winter type squash out together uh, and feel pretty good about not cross-pollinating on those. Um, and then our Pepo family, which is our summer squash, fits in real nicely. So we don't really have to limit the amount of squash we're going to grow in our garden just to save seed on. Um, and so your crooknecks, all your zucchinis, uh, those are going to be your pepo. There are some decorative gourds in that class as well. Um, but there's four different varieties you could grow out in the garden uh, and save seed from all those. And so, like I said, with the summer or the winter squash, let it sit around for 30 more days. Of course, the longer you let your winter squash sit around, the more starch converts to sugar, the sweeter it's going to be. Um, and so that works out well for seed too. As long as you don't let it rot, your seeds will get nice and mature in there. And so when you're ready to eat it, just dig the seeds out and save on those. And then for the summer squash, um, yeah, just let those get those, you know, let one or two of those big ones that get away from you, go ahead and get, nice and big, uh, and then go ahead and cut those off when they really start to get discolored and, and that really pale yellow and pull those off, let them sit around for a little bit longer, uh, but go ahead and harvest the seed out before they rot. And then your seed will be nice and mature and viable. Um, and so um, I take a quarter inch mesh screen and uh, kind of spray uh, all the loose pulp and the strings off of that. If they're not coming off really good, you could put them in a bucket and soak them for a couple hours and then go ahead and spray all that off. And then again, just spread them out on a screen works really well for these. Um, but if you don't have one, a baking sheet will do the same too. And again, just moving those around, breaking them up uh, and then put them in that bowl uh, next to all your tomatoes and beans you already have. And then uh, swish them around for about a month and into the freezer. And peppers. Again, we'll have to have some tough decisions to be made. Maybe you can collaborate with some friends or neighbors uh, because isolation distance for peppers, uh, you know, 300 feet. I generally do about 750 feet on my peppers. So I can do a, a few out on my property. 
Uh, but but while they are self-pollinating, they still have a good chance of crossing. Um, and again, another easy one, uh, the seeds mature when you're ready to eat them. So that's just a really easy one. So uh, when you're ready to eat it, pull the seeds out. They don't take a whole lot of washing or maintenance. Uh, and you can just pull those out and dry them with the same way you did those tomato seeds. You don't have to ferment them or anything. Just get them in a bowl, move them around for a month, and then into the freezer. Again, for the backyard gardener, five to 10 plants, I feel good about uh, the genetics you'll preserve in that. One of my favorites there is on the left, that's the fish pepper. It's really popular back in, in Baltimore and fish houses and things like that. It goes great with clam dishes and whatnot. Just really gives a nice, a nice uh, spice to some of our, our seafood dishes. And that's how it was kind of traditionally used, hence the name. And this, the one on the right, y'all don't need to fool with because that's a northern variety of pepper and uh, that's called Wisconsin Lake. So uh, I wouldn't, I mean, you can give it a shot, but I'd find a pepper that does good down in your neck of the woods. And then lettuce. Lettuce is a super easy one, too. Again, you know, uh, the Middle East, Iran, Turkey, Palestine, this is where this is coming from. The, the Egyptians were growing it 6,000 years ago. The Greeks and Romans talk about it 2,000 years ago. Um, but lettuces will cross with wild lettuces. Uh, so that's something you have to keep in mind. But the isolation distance is only 10 to 20 feet. So that's pretty easy. So you could grow several types in your garden and keep those isolated from each other. Um, and again, it's a perfect flower, but, um, um, so here, I'll show you this here. This, we've all seen this. It's when it gets too hot and the lettuce is bolt. And so that's what they're doing on the left. And then the picture on the right kind of shows you at seed maturity. So those little poppuses look like little dandelions. That's uh, your lettuce seed and it's ready to be mature. We put these bags around them. A, we can grow them side by side without them crossing in there. Uh, but then those, uh, those nettings also catch all the seed for us. Uh, but what you can do when you see those poppuses start to pop open and you've got about half of them that way, you can just take a brown paper bag, kind of knock the plant over and start knocking those into it, knocking the, uh, the seed. It'll just fall right into your bag. Um, do that a couple of times on a plant and you'll have all the lettuce seed you'll probably need for a lifetime. So uh, it's really easy to save, uh, save lettuce seed. All right, and this is the last one I'm going to talk about. We talk about the brassicola or ACA, which has my favorite crop in it, which is collards. Uh, but that's your broccoli, your cabbage, your Brussels sprouts, cauliflower, kale, Mediterranean in origin. Um, again, insect uh, pollination, so 800 feet to half a mile. Um, but the good thing about this one, since it's a biennial crop, um, and here we're going to grow all these in the fall. We will grow some in the spring, but for a seed crop, we're going to grow it in the fall and then we're going to overwinter it and then we'll get our seed come spring. So you could grow all these varieties in your, in your fall garden and just decide which one you're going to save seed on that year and rogue and pull all the other ones and say you're going to work on kale this year. Just pull everything else, leave the kale in the garden and let it go to seed in the spring. Um, um, and so, and then it'll grow up and it'll put on little green pods and then they'll turn brown and dry almost like little tiny beans in a way. Uh, they have five to 10 seeds in each. Um, and then you can do the same thing with that as they put on a lot of those dried pods. You can either harvest the whole plant and hang it over a bag or you can take a bag and kind of knock those into it. Um, but one season of saving on Oler ACA and you'll have all the seed you'll need for a lifetime of that crop. Um, and if we have any teachers or, or school gardeners or anything like that, uh, this is a great crop for schools uh, because many of our crops are grown in the summer or we're doing seed saving in the summer when kids aren't there. Um, but this is a crop that we could start in the fall and work with them from seed to seed through the entire school year. So it's a great school crop to kind of show biennial seed saving with kids. That's just me being silly with collards. That's the old timey blue collard. Uh, just a beautiful plant. Those are the, the bolts on it. And, and any of those, especially collards, like you overwinter those and they'll put on little bolts in the spring that taste just like broccoli and pretty fantastic. 
Um, but you don't have to remember all this. We do produce what uh, a publication called the Seed Garden. Uh, and there's a few different um, seed guides out there. Um, I've worn this out for years. Uh, it really puts everything in perspective and shows you just how easy it is. It'll let you know, you don't have to remember what squash can I grow with what squash. It lays it all out for you. So this is a really great guide for seed for seed saving. And it it pretty much cover all your crop types in there. So this is a picture of the inside of our seed bank. Oh. You know, it is a garden community that dictated kind of how this seed bank grew. And so it was kind of developed from what people cherished and wanted to save seed on or or what they were saving and didn't have anybody else uh, to continue the stewardship. So they sent it on to us. And so the seed bank was created by donors. We didn't really go out and look for seed kind of early in the early days of Seed Savers Exchange. They did go and, you know, kind of reached out to see what seeds people had and kind of did that. Uh, but for the most part, it's just seeds that are sent our way. And that's kind of, so it's been built by the community, uh, you know, the gardening community across the U.S. Uh, and and then some, some times further than that, uh, that kind of, they're the ones, this is what everybody cherished and wanted saved. And so it came to us and that's how it grew, kind of organically like that. But this is where I'd like to make the most important point of this talk. And that true preservation happens in your backyard. You know, because we're simply a holding place where the seeds are stored, you know, in hopes that someone requests them and start growing them in their backyard. And so what we do is we identify seeds that are in low quantity or have low germination rates. And then we grow those out so we can increase their quantities and make them more viable so folks uh, can request them will have higher success. So what we're trying to do is get quantities up so we can share them with the public. And so, because if they just sit in the seed bank, then they're what we call functionally extinct. They're alive, but they're not doing anything. So, um, and so our job is to keep them alive and then figure out how to get them into your backyard and out into the garden community. And that's where the gardening community comes into play. You know, and that's where we're hoping that you, know, you write us, email us, or simply get onto the exchange and request some of the varieties that we make available uh, in in the in the seed bank. And you know, start learning the farming culture behind these seeds, and then teaching others about it. You know, like Sue's father who grew the Fort and White pumpkin on the edge of the garden and trained them into the corn. Or start selecting for desirable traits, just how Regina saved the seeds on only her best tomatoes, therefore selecting for generations of great flavor. To start using them in family dishes, just like John Withy and the Saturday night pot of beans. Or, you know, how we use them for holidays, like Sue Ellen did in, the, in their Thanksgiving Day pumpkin. And then start creating the family stories, because many times the stories are just important as the seeds, them, as the seeds themselves, you know. They reflect the history of a family and a community. All right. You know, and, and you know, I, I hammer this down, but you know, it's it's we need them out in people's yards so y'all are selecting, you know, for the traits that do well in your zone. So y'all are in a different place. And so um, you know, we need seeds being selected for and as you know, and, and in the climates. Uh, uh, that they're growing in so and selecting that way um, and that's where people really find find the value you know when they come with rich stories that reflect the cultures and the stewardship history of the heirloom seeds and that's what really starts to make them attractive to others so that's why we have two historians on site so we can collect the stories and the histories as soon as they come because many times they come to us from from folks getting on up in their age. And we've got to get those stories quick because if we don't get them, they get lost. And it's what drives people to want to continue on these, uh, carrying on these seeds. So I'm not going to go through all these, but I do want to talk about a couple because I know we're kind of short on time here. Um, but I do want to talk about the exchange yearbook. Um, and this is where a community of gardeners and seed stewards are sharing and swapping heritage seeds that you just might not find anywhere else. Um, and so you can go on here either online, and I'll actually 
I'll pop this into the chat. So I just put into the chat there. Um, you can go on our go on our site and look at the exchange, and that's where you'll find this. Um, and so you can search by crop type, or you can find someone in your state that's uh, working on seeds and saving and sharing those seeds. And chances are that those varieties are going to do well in your state. So find somebody in Southern California that's offering seeds, and odds are that it's going to do well in your region. And now the work, you know, the exchange works to keep bio biodiversity strong. Um, there's over 15,000 unique varieties in this in this catalog, um, and it's the doorway to the vault. And so I don't really care for that term vault because it sounds inaccessible. But our seed bank is not. It's a literal. It's literally a bank. Um, and so we really just want people to request seeds from us uh, and, and get them out there growing. So this is the doorway to the vault. And so there's hundreds of seed savers that list their seeds in this catalog. Uh, and, and we also list all the varieties in our seed bank that we have enough to share with folks. Um, and so I just want to make the, the, the distinction here. The one on the left is the annual catalog that we send out, like your Johnny's catalog or any of your other seed catalogs. There's 660 varieties in there. Uh, and that's, that's just, it's a normal seed catalog. The one on the right, the yearbook, that's the one I'm talking about that has 15,000 varieties. And that's a publication that the preservation department puts on. <clears throat> so I'm gonna talk about one more thing here. I'd like to share the ADAPT program because it'd be nice to get some folks in your region involved with this. So this is a big community science project that we put on. Uh, last year, we had 710 participants, and this year we've had over 1,000 folks sign up. And so this is where we offer trials um, on varieties from the collection. Many of them we don't know anything about. And so it's a way to get the community involved to understand the collection we have and the traits and the characteristics that they, they hold. Um, and it also gives us, you know, um, just a lot of information um, and helps us select other varieties that might go into our main catalog. And so we offer, I think this year, we've got 12 different crop types that folks can trial. Um, and so within each crop type, we'll offer eight to 10 varieties of that crop type. And then we'll choose a control, which will be one selection out of the catalog. And so let's say somebody signs up to do the sorghum or the collard trial, we'll, you'll get three varieties of that crop type randomly selected uh, and sent out to you. And each participant can choose multiple trials. So in the first week of March, we'll send you a kit containing seeds, plant labels, a data sheet, and instructions for submitting your data. And so we're asking folks to evaluate um, on each variety a handful of key characteristics, including yield, earliness, appearance, disease resistance, and flavor. Flavor is a huge one. No one wants to grow anything that doesn't taste very good. Uh, so we really focus a lot on flavor also. And then we ask folks to enter. So you can either do a by hand uh, data sheet and fill that out. Otherwise, we um, partner with Seedlinked, which is an online platform. Um, that you can enter data there. And then the neat thing about that is, is we can pull up an interactive map of the United States and see where all the collar trials are and what varieties they are going and what rating they're getting. And so we can look around the country and see how well these varieties are performing around the country. And that gives us good clues of where these are gonna perform the best. And so we can then focus on those regions. Uh, but it's a really nice, nice tool. Um, we're looking at it to, to uh, um, incorporate um, our Apple collection too. Uh, so see, I check out Seedlink. It's a pretty neat, pretty neat place. Um, so yeah. And uh, yeah, I think we're getting on time. So um, probably pass on a couple of the other things I could talk on. If anybody's interested in, in doing some true preservation work that John and I used to do and would like to help grow out varieties and increase those quantities. Uh, we do have a renew program that you can find on the site uh, for any experienced seed growers. Uh, this is a real, uh, this is really helpful stuff um, to get the community involved. 
um, got a neat thing going and, and uh, it's the heirloom collar project. And we just recently uh, partnered with edible schoolyard and we're writing curriculum right now um, uh, with the, uh, with a curriculum writer from edible schoolyard and incorporating historical um, things around collards as well as genetics and so many things. And we're putting that into curriculum and uh, we've got about 50 schools around the country in the edible schoolyard uh, uh, group uh, that are joining us on this. So I'm really excited about that. Um, but yeah, you know, I, I can end there and, you know, you know, and like I said, you know, we're just one of the many organizations around the country involved in efforts to engage and educate others on how to help preserve biodiversity of our foodways and all the cultures that are intertwined with those. Um, that right there is my son Fields. Uh, He's a young little farmer. He's holding the Middle East Peace Cucumber. Uh, that's carried by True Love Seed, a good partner. I uh, love that seed company. So check them out. They're fantastic. But um, thank you for your time and your attention. Uh, and I hope those that are involved keep up the good work. Keep sharing your knowledge. Uh, and those that haven't begun, well, no time like the present, right? So thank you all very much. Cool. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you, man. Uh, do you have uh, time for um, some questions from our club? Absolutely. Okay, cool. Um, everyone on Zoom, we'll, uh, we'll have you go first um, because you won't be here as long. Go ahead, Pat. What question do you have? Um, see, I, I don't know if you know, but there's a lot of genetic engineering that goes on in San Diego. Um, Genetic court isn't far from me, and there are a bunch of genetic courts. And one of our universities has has grown engineered things in open fields. Um, it's my understanding that because there are brassica growing in the wildlife preserve near me, that I really shouldn't save brassica seeds in my you know little twentieth of a. 20th of an acre plot that my house is plunked in the middle of. Yeah, you know, like it, I said, it, it really depends on how far you are away from them, you know. Um, I mean, you, yeah, I mean, a half mile, you know, it can be, you know. Um, so, yeah, if you're within that half mile, is a, is a good chance that, yeah, you could get crossed up with any other earlier ACA that's that's growing in that, that area. So, other, yeah. Other thing, two things. Have you heard of, and I, this I read has gone on in San Diego and probably elsewhere, that they are tinkering with putting um, vaccinations into vegetables. I think that should be banned. I think it's horrible. How do you control the dosage? Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. I've, I I had seen and read something about that, and I thought that's just the craziest thing I ever heard of. Like, <laughs> I don't know, it's just silliness. Like, I I don't get like we spend we spend so much money working and developing these things, and that's that's one of the I'm working with Seedlink because you know you got you know even in just breeding product projects, you know one university will spend thirty thousand dollars. Uh, uh you know, with one thing, you know, and we've got a community of, of breeders that, you know, we're, we're kind of doing some community, you know, old natural breeding techniques uh, that you just don't need all that. We just waste so much money tinkering with things. I think what do we spend $500 million to come up to the cosmic apple or something like that? Like <laughs> just an older scientist told me that through genetic engineering, it, it takes so many trials to come up with something they want and only 200 seeds from mother nature to come up with what's needed. Yeah. It's a whole lot smarter than the foolish scientists. Yeah. We get all the genetics we need to work with for breeders or just got, I mean, you know, even, even you just get some seeds out of, out of our bank and, you know, so many of these things, you know, I don't even fool with seeds. I, you know, people ask me, well, what do you, what do you spray on them? Like, if I got to spray something on, I ain't fooling with it. And so I find varieties I don't have to spray, you know, I got, you know, and so, uh, 
Yeah, I, it's just a lot of wasted money in that industry when when we've got, you know, a community of, you know, I like community science projects and, you know, the trust that you can put in those those communities. And that's a project, the larger project we're working with Seed Savers Exchange is to prove that as a community of community scientists and farmers and gardeners that we can produce uh, seeds that are um, adapted uh, to climate change and whatnot at way faster and much cheaper than the larger folks and even universities are doing. So yeah, I power in the people, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't, I don't know. There's only one presidential candidate right now that I'm aware of that has asked if, if people are doing events for him that the food and drink that served be organic, only mm. one. Wow. He's not Democrat and he's not Republican. <laughs> RFK Jr. Yeah, yeah. Well. Um, yeah, I, hey Pat, we're to the next question. I had a couple here. Um, Thank let me you. see, anybody else Thank from you. the Zoom had a, have a question? Okay, awesome. Um, anyone in the audience have a question? Okay. Yep. Uh, this is Dave Sohn from our San Diego chapter. We, uh, at our 2015 Festival of Fruit, which was he held here in uh, San Diego, uh, Tom Dell Hotel was the main ramrod with that. And Corey and Lena may remember that, but uh, we had a uh, presenter that was one of the main presenters that was a seed gatherer from all around the world. And he had gathered seeds from all kinds of countries in the desert and Sahara all, all over. And he did a uh, presentation at our uh, Festival of Fruit as one of the uh, uh, keynote speakers. And um, I can't remember his name, but it Joseph was- uh, Cox. Was I'm sorry. Joseph, was it Joseph Simcox? Yes, that's who it was. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, I can still remember that uh, uh, because they did promote an awful lot of uh, the uh, seed uh, preservation back at that time. And that was uh, at our 2015 uh, here in San Diego chapter uh, festival of fruit for all of our uh, fruit gardeners. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's amazing the, the 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 diversity that that's around the world, and you know that that's you know that's kind of goes to my point of like you can find seed that that won't get all bug eight, you know that you know mustards is a tough one down in Tennessee, but I happen to ha find a little uh, mustard out of Japan called manuba um, that just you know I don't know. Those little bugs in Tennessee didn't much care for it. And it, it thrived really well in the heat and the moisture and uh, was late to bolt and and just had very low uh, pest pressure on it. And so that's just, you know, to the point, there's just so much diversity in the world and um, it's already been selected for by humans through time that there's a lot to work with. Yep. Okay, Ben in the chat had a question. Um... Let me see. Is there more info on the ADAPT program on, I guess, a, your website? Or can you put that info in the chat, maybe? Let me let me put that in the chat real quick. I'll get you there. Okay. Give me just one second. And I'll get you a link up in there. Yeah, you know, Appleseed's a uh, good place to go is the uh, um, Kevin uh, up in uh, Riverside, uh, apple uh, growing apples in the city. Uh, he has uh, a lot of stuff. It's like, like for example, the Arkansas Black. It's an heirloom apple, 100 odd years old, and uh, still a very beautiful, deep red, almost black colored skin apple and very flavorful uh better than any delicious you've ever eaten <laughs> yeah there ain't much delicious about a red delicious is there no <laughs> yeah um one of our uh, members had a question here 
yeah, I'm kind of curious about the apple seed. They're really not interested in the seed, I don't think. So what's kind of the goal? Are they for a rootstock or are they to uh, get a different variety? Or what, what do you think about it? Your apple seeds, Sharon, oh, they did never get the goal. That makes sense. Yeah, I just popped that into the into the chat. That's a that's a direct link to to the Adapt program, uh, and sign up's still still open for that. It'll it'll close here pretty soon uh, in the next week or so. So anybody wanting to get involved with that, it's it's really fun. And yeah, you know we do have about a thousand different varieties of apples um, at Seed Service Exchange. So we do. Dabble in apples quite a bit. Uh, I think John's question was like, uh, since they don't seem to do to be true to seed very well or try too much very much. What is the point in saving apple seeds back? If I'm not mistaken, John. Yeah, or is it? Yeah, is it for rootstock purposes or just trying to get a new variety of apple? Or are they really that close? Where you get the same thing? Yeah, I mean, yeah, that's with apples, you know. I mean, there's only a handful that grow true to type. Like, I think Nickajack's one that can grow true to type. Uh, some crabs and like that can. Um, you know, it's funny because, you know, so many of the apples that became popularized, right? And here I'm talking to folks who probably know way more than I, I do about this stuff. But, you know, the apples that came, that were popularized, if you, unless you were affluent, in the 1700s and could afford rootstock from the UK as some pippins or whatnot, well, you were just, you know, you were sowing apple seed and getting whatever genetics you got. And then, you know, you could be down in Georgia and find that Susie Smith's got the tastiest apple in the county. And then folks hear about Susie Smith's apple or whatnot. And, and they come and get, get a, a cutting off of that. And and that's how you know many of those old varieties got popularized, but um, but yeah, they they just don't grow true to seed, right? So maybe know. just to keep whatever good genetics. I mean, it it may not be true to type, but you'll still get a chunk of those good genetics preserved. Well, and you know, and I I uh, let's see, was it a couple winters ago, or maybe it was yeah. We um around here there's a there's a horse farm and it's just got tons of apples all over it. And they're all just seedling apples that have planted themselves and grown up in the trees and just has stayed untouched. You know, and everybody says, well, you know, just seedling apples, those random random apples, they're nothing, they're just spitters, like they're no good, or maybe you could use them for a oh. cider or something like that. But we went in that orchard. And we tasted so many different random seedling apples till our bellies got sick. And I'd say 90% of them were delicious. And the other thing that I realized about them is that there was little to no bug damage or disease, you know? And so these were apples that just, you know, got raised where they laid and, and just did their own things. And, and the good ones survived and the others didn't. Um, and so... We've actually been talking lately about um, going out into that orchard and finding the 10 apples we like the most, grafting off of them and putting them in our orchard to kind of talk about seedlings and the randomness that that, that can be. Um, and then an old uh, cider maker around here came out with us and collected a whole bunch of apples. And he had a bunch of old timers out there that were well versed in cider pressing and whatnot. And they just got giddy when that press came down in the aroma that came off of all those seedling apples. And it produced some of the best cider I've ever tasted. So uh, it started making me think about apples a little bit different. <laughs> cool. Uh, anybody else want to ask any questions in my group? All right. OK. Thank you very much, kind sir. Um, sharing your knowledge this evening and uh yeah you have a lovely evening Dude.